Your Excellency, dear Rector, dear colleagues, uh, students and alumni, wherever you are at this moment in time in Leuven, in Flanders, or around the world, it is my great pleasure to welcome you here today at this Ambassador's Lecture. Still in a remote format, but uh, with once more a very important speaker on a very timely topic. The advantage of having a format like this is also that uh, we have a much larger reach than usually in this fantastic uh, promotion hall uh, of uh, this university central building with over 900 subscriptions participating or possibly uh, participating in this event. So that's a real success and uh, I think uh, this also has to do, uh, um, Your Excellency, with the presence and the topic of uh, today. His Excellency Makita Shimokawa, the Ambassador of Japan to the Kingdom of Belgium, Belgium and NATO, today will talk about Japan in the new world order, charting its own cars facing new global challenges. And we all look very much forward to your uh, views and uh, your opinion in this uh, very particular uh, era that we are living. Ambassador uh, Shimokawa is in Belgium since uh, September 2019, already quite some time ago. Um, and uh, he already has visited Kai Leuven on a couple of occasions. Uh, um, first visiting our library, and then he was also the honorable guest in December 2019, when our colleague Professor Hideaki Mizuno organized very successfully uh, the Kai Leuven Rieken Symposium, focusing on possibilities for scientific and technological collaboration between uh, Rieken and Kai Leuven. So if I'm not counting wrong, this is your third uh, visit, Mr. Ambassador, and you are again most welcome here uh, at our university. We do appreciate, in general, your generous support for uh, uh, the strong relation that our university has with Japan, and in particular for the generous support you gave to the exhibition and the other events for the commemoration of the centennial of the 1920s uh, Japanese book donation at Kai Leuven, UC Louvain. 2020 was not the best year to have a centennial celebration, as we have uh, noticed. It was and is an important year for this relation nevertheless and uh, um, although we had great plans among other having festivities and a special exhibition um, yeah we still have this uh, to come and uh, we are looking forward for you to visit the collection in uh, UC Louvain with our colleagues in louvain la Neuve, and do hope that whenever this is going to be possible we also will be able to uh, have uh, uh, a more physical celebration uh, with, as you may expect, a glass of beer uh, that we may offer you. I am um, not going to take more time. I'm just welcoming you once more uh, and I'm looking forward to a um, um, visionary speech about what uh, Jap Japan and yourself are thinking about the uh, world order. Um, we all are facing global challenges now in this uh, pandemic situation in particular um, uh, and uh, look forward to what you have to say about that. Now before giving you, uh, Mr. Ambassador, the floor, it is my great pleasure to invite uh, Professor Dimitri van Overbeke to introduce the topic and uh, also to introduce, to, and to introduce you further um, uh, before we then can proceed to your lectures. Thank you very much. Excellency, Rector, Vice-Rector, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, dear students, it is a true honor to have been asked to give an academic introduction to Ambassador Shimokawa's lecture. I will do this in three parts based on the research that we are conducting at the section of Japanese studies and at the Leuven Center for Global Governance Studies. First, the solid history of the relations starting in what was in the 19th century, the New World Order, 
with many global challenges. Then, a short illustration about the stability and dynamics of one of the institutions that is at the core of the relationship, namely the rule of law. And finally, the institutional framework in the EU-Japan relationship to tackle many current challenges, including, of course, COVID-19, but also contestations to the liberal international order. Around 1868, a new era dawned for Japan. Japan signed friendship and trade treaties, treaties with the main powers in the world at that time. It was the advent of a time of modernization and the exchange of knowledge. In 2016, we celebrated the 150th anniversary of this itinerary of mutual inspiration. Belgium was also a relatively new nation in the turbulent world of the 19th century. It had established institutions to face the challenges it was facing as a small country surrounded by major powers. Institutions Douglas North would define as the rules of the game. And these would be crucial to facing the challenges ahead by establishing, by establishing predict predictability, order and efficiency in society. Very soon, Belgium and Japan started building a house of common understandings, brick by brick, in which transparent rules and procedures were to pave the way for global engagement. One of the key institutions that was considered crucial for coping with global challenges in the turbulent 19th century was the Constitution. Belgium has drafted a constitution in 1831 that was key to what Howgood called the model state of Belgium. As a young civil servant, aged 27, Inoue Kowashi, who would draft Japan's first constitution in 1889, was impressed by the Belgium example and was inspired by it when he drafted the institutional contours of the new Meiji Japan in the 1880s. Inspiration for institution building, even closer to us today, was when in 1876, the mission of the architect of, of, the modern, of modern Japanese police and prison system, Kawaji Toshiyoshi, went by horse carriage from Leuven Station to Leuven Central Prison. He was impressed by the organization of the recently built prison and based the building of the first modern prison in Japan on the Leuven concept. Here on the slide, you can see at your right-hand side uh, a replica of the Leuven prison, but there is one big difference. And the big difference is that it was built out of wood and not out of brick, so it doesn't exist anymore today, but it was modeled after the Leuven prison. I pref um, I would, it would be wrong, however, to talk about institutional transplants. I prefer to use the concept of translation and adaptation to the time and social context, which is a dynamic process. Inspiration was mutual indeed. The rich and elegant culture and solid institutions were a source of inspirations for so many sectors in Belgium and Europe at the time. Art, diplomacy, trade, and creativity. Again, very close to us, we can find a unique testimony of this mutual inspiration, a collection of more than 10,000 books that was donated exactly one century ago by Japan to the University of Louvain after the First World War. The books are now well preserved at the UCL. The precious furniture and decoration is still here at the KU Leuven. The centennial of the donation is an opportunity to build new bridges. My colleague Jan Schmidt is organizing an exhibition, book publication, and fundraising campaign to develop the immense research opportunities this book collection offers. One of the institutions that is at the core of the relationship is the rule of law. Focusing our research on Japan, we can conclude that it is a stable institution with a clear policy venue including the Supreme Court, the Ministry of Justice, and the Japan Federation of Bar Associations. This institution conceives the policies related to law and the judiciary. The venue, however, is consolidated by public discourse, the mood, you could say. 
that for a long time, from the 1950s to the beginning of the 1990s, was very stable in favor of hybridity between a formal and informal approach to law. Hence, an emphasis on mediation procedures, apologies, and restorative justice, as we, as we say. Institutions such as the rule of law, however, are dynamic, operating in a changing social environment. In the 1990s, when Japan faced a new challenge of economic crisis, the public discourse shifted. Change and reform, but also privatization and deregulation became the keywords in policy making with a spillover to the subsystem of justice. The government of Japan, eager to find adequate answers to the new challenges of the 1990s and stimulated by the discourse of the time, decided to install a council with stakeholders of the rule of law. These stakeholders, professors, judges, prosecutors, lawyers, company executives, and even a representative of the Japanese Housewife Association, debated about a new justice system for the 21st century. They were, they were supported by a new paradigm, by a mood, you could say, that was asking for more participation of citizens in the criminal trials, the strengthening of the rule of law, the reform of the bar, etc. After two years of careful debate, the stakeholders came to a conclusion and handed their support, their report, to the prime minister of the time, Prime Minister Koizumi. The government decided to implement the recommendation swiftly. Major changes were, for example, decentralizing education of legal professionals to, to law schools and establishing a jury system in criminal matters. Almost two decades have passed since the report was handed to the prime minister, and we can conclude that the changes are impressive. The rule of law is being strengthened thanks to the dynamics of social contestation. The challenges of the 1990s were turned into opportunities for the 21st century. Today again, we are facing a series of severe crises. Of course, the COVID-19 pandemic, but also the crisis of the, the liberal international order. Amid crises and contestations, stakeholders dynamics is the base for turning challenges into opportunities. A case in point is the 2019 Economic Partnership Agreement, the EPA, and the Strategic Partnership Agreement, SPA, between Japan and the EU. Japan and the EU will collaborate ever more and in a more structured way, both bilaterally and multilaterally in the context of global governance. The speed at which the institutions of the EU-Japan partnership have been developing in recent years is indeed impressive and hints at a window of opportunity for, part, for this partnership to become an example for new and positive forms of connectivity around the world. Yuval Noah Harari eloquently writes that humanity needs to make a choice. Will we travel down the route of disunity or will we adopt the, the path of global solidarity? If we choose disunity, this will not only prolong the crisis, but will probably result in even worse catastrophes in the future. I think that the history of solidarity between Belgium and Japan and the functioning of institutions is evidence that Japan, Belgium, and the EU opt for the path of global solidarity to cope with current and future global challenges. We are very pleased, Your Excellency, to have you here with us today. And we are really looking forward to your speech about how Japan copes with global challenges. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. And I gladly hand you the floor for the main part of this presentation of this event. Thank you very much. Dear Professor Luc Sels, uh, Rector of KU Leuven, dear Professor uh, Peter Lewins, uh, Vice Rector, 
dear Professor Dmitry Fanovarecki, Research Group, Japanese Studies, and Chair of a Regional Commission, Committee for Japan and South Korea. Dear Professor Jan Wouters, Director of Lubin Center for Global Governance Studies. Dear students, uh, dear friends, thank you very much for inviting me to this lecture. It gives me a great pleasure to have an occasion of talking about Japan's course facing new challenges in the world. Before getting into the subject, let me share my personal view. I have the feeling that around every 10 years, some, somewhere around the turn of the decade, something beyond my imagination, and which have a strong long-time effect impact on the years to follow, occurs in history. The fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 and the end of the Cold War were certainly one of those events which changed the international order afterwards. In 2001, September 11, it was the breathtaking terrorist attack in the United States which abruptly took place, which has led the world to a new era of fighting terrorism, which continues to our date. In the 2010s, we saw the rise of emerging powers and changes in the shift in global power balance. And for us Japanese, in March 2011, the Great Earth, East Japan earthquake occurred, which also provoked the crisis in Fukushima nuclear plant caused by the Great Tsunami. We will be commemorating its 10th Memorial Day very, very soon. Then it was in 2020 that we experienced the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. It is not yet under control, disrupting our daily lives to the extreme, and we expect that the post-COVID world will not be completely the same as was before. Although this is not the first pandemic in the history of mankind, who would have expected a pande pandemic of this magnitude in your lifetime? It was in this juncture that in Japan, Prime Minister Abe, who had led the administration for the longest period in Japanese constitutional history, resigned in September last year due to health reasons and passed the baton to Mr. Suga who has served as his chief cabinet secretary for the entire period of the administration. Like the other leaders of the world, Prime Minister Suga's current biggest challenge is to fight COVID-19, to protect the lives, the health, and the livelihood of people, and is yet to carry out his full-scale diplomacy. I would like to structure my uh, lecture in three parts. First, the international environment surrounding Japan. Second, uh, the Jap Japan's policy priorities, going back to Prime Minister Abe's era and even before. Third, concluding remarks. First, on the international environment surrounding Japan, it is said that the shift in global power balance has increased uh, the importance of the Asia-Pacific region, both politically and economically, but is accompanied by the security environment in the East Asia, which is becoming more severe and more uncertain. North Korea, for example, which is pressing forward the development of its nuclear weapons and missiles programs, has repeatedly held ballistic missile launch tests, coupled with its uh, political system it has become a destabilizing factor, not only for the Asia-Pacific region, but also for the international community as a whole. Although the provocative actions of the PRK seem to have temporarily subsided while the US-North Korea dialogue was taking place in 2018, its leaders recently reconfirmed its determination to pursue its nuclear and missile program, and the situation is a source of serious concern. As for China, with its rapid expansion of economic power from the beginning of the 21st century, 
and the continuous reinforcement of its military power over many years, China's actions and postures can be described as being more assertive or even aggressive. A good example of this is in its activities in the East China Sea and South China Sea in its attempt to unilaterally change the status quo and its hard position on issues related to Hong Kong and Taiwan. It is also trying to cast larger influence in all parts of the globe in competition with the traditional Western powers or values by advocating and implementing the Belt and Road Initiative or by increasing its pressure a presence and influence in international institutions and organizations. The COVID-19 pandemic has made its presence even more visible, for example, by pursuing public information offensive by so-called wolf warrior diplomats or make diplomacy, uh, mask diplomacy, and now the vaccine diplomacy. In Northeast Asia, Russia is another military power with nuclear weapons. It should be noted, however, that the presence of China overwhelmingly surpasses that of Russia in the Far East in terms of population or economic power. Against this backdrop, the regional cooperation framework in the Asia-Pacific region in terms of security is not sufficiently institutionalized. Under such circumstances, for many countries, it is the alliance with the United States or close political and economic ties with it which provides the basis for its national defense, stability, and prosperity. As I will elaborate later, the Japan-US alliance is the linchpin of Japanese foreign policy and security. The United States, since President Obama announced its pivot rebalance to Asia-Pacific in 2012, have prioritized his commitment to the region. President Trump's policy in the region was somehow opaque or unpredictable, although Prime Minister Abe enjoyed very close and frequent contacts and communications with the president. Since his inauguration, President Biden is announcing series of new policies and orientations in diplomacy, and it is expected that the engagement of the US in the Asia-Pacific region will be maintained and reinforced. Let me now touch upon Japan's policy priorities, looking back to Prime Minister Abe's government and thereafter. When Prime Minister Abe took office for the second time at the end of 2012, it was, he was set to realize many reforms and transformations in Japanese politics, economy, and society in order to restore uh, the sense of confidence and pride in the nation. Throughout his administration, the main issues to tackle were, number one, how to restore the vitality of the Japanese economy. Number two, how to restore and strengthen the US -Jap Japan-US alliance. Number three, how to interact in the international community, especially in face of the rise in China, among others. First on the economy, Regarding the recovery of the economy, Prime Minister led the so-called Abenomics with three arrows, aggressive monetary policy, flexible fiscal policy, and growth strategy to st stimulate private investment. It revived stock prices, economic growth, corporate performance, and employment, so that the Japanese economy was restored for the first time since 20 years. Furthermore, this was supported by policies such as to encourage women's participation in economic and social activities, to promote inbound tourism to Japan from abroad through bold measures, and to attract foreign labor force by creating a new status of residence. It was Mr. Suga, then the Chief Cabinet Secretary, who was the mastermind of these policies who had powerfully pushed the bureaucracy to realize them quickly. It is a pity that many of these measures and achievements had to be temporarily suspended because of the current pandemic. On the other hand, 
a wider adoption of teleworking is leading a nation to some signs of change. Digitalization of economy, society, and education, review of working habits and supply chain, changing in life, work style, which it did not happen so easily in Japan up to the present. This is one of the reasons why Prime Minister Suga has announced that the digitalization, i.e. the digitalization of government administration, economy, society, so forth, will be one of the top priority in his administration. On the international front, when President Trump announced that the US will withdraw from the TPP agreement, the government of Japan took the initiative to transform the agreement into the TPP of 11 and uh, achieved an agreement in a short period of time, which entered into force in December 2018. Partly inspired by this, the Japan, EU, EPA, and SPA became effective in February 2019, and the Japan-US trade agreement on goods entered into force in April 2019. After Prime Minister Suga took office in September last year, the Japan-UK EPA, in preparation for breakfast, was quickly concluded, and the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, the RCEP agreement, was agreed. RCEP is an unprecedented mega FTA that comprises a diverse mix of developed, developing, and least developed countries uh, for the f and establishes for the first time a web of bilateral EPA relationship between the three big economies, i.e. Japan, China, and Republic of Korea. This was signed in November, signed in November uh, 2020. All these achievements have been possible with the strong leadership of Prime Minister's office, as well as the relevant ministers, including Foreign Minister Mr. Motegi, who were all convinced that the expanding the networks of EPAs and FTAs will serve to strengthen the vitality of the Japanese economy. As protectionism and inward-looking tendencies spread worldwide, and where the impact of the COVID-19 may result in disruption to the flow of goods and services, and thus requires reviewing of the supply chain, it is becoming increasingly important to strengthen and deepen the international economic relations by enhancing the use of the FTAs and EPAs, and at the same time strengthening the multilateral rule-based system, uh, such as the WTO, including through its reform. Japan will continue to take a lead in pursuing those double objectives in close coordination with partners like European Union and the United States, who we expect will return to multilateralism and free trade. On the Japan-US alliance, as I said earlier, this is a linchpin of Japan's foreign policy and security as well as a cornerstone of peace and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific region. Immediately after arriving to the second administration, Prime Minister Abe established the National Security Council to strengthen Japan's decision-making structure in security and diplomacy, and adopted the National Security Strategy in 2013. In the same year, the Act on Protection of Specially Designated Secrets was enacted to facilitate exchange and sh sh sharing of intelligence with other co partner countries. After establishing such a foundation for national security, a series of laws and uh, laws collectively referred to as the legislation for peace and security was enacted in 2015, which broadened the possibility of the use of force with our core ally the United States under certain new conditions and provided legal basis uh, for Japan to participate in a wider range of international peace cooperation activities, such as the UN PKO. At the same time, the defense-related budget, which had been declining for 11 consecutive years until fiscal year 2012, was reversed to an increase after fiscal year 2013, reaching a 
record of around 42 billion US dollar in fiscal year 2020. Development of such defense capabilities is extremely important in consolidating the Japan-US alliance, jointly preparing for the increasing severe security environment in Northeast Asia and in underpinning a robust diplomacy. Currently, about 55,000 US military troops are stationed in Japan, and they will act together with Japan to meet the common danger of armored attack in the Japanese territory and the, the region, the territory administered under Japan, and contribute to the peace and security of the region. Further strengthening the US alliance, Japan-US alliance, will, with the new Biden administration, including strengthening the deterrence and responsible capabilities, and working closer to advance the achievement of free and open Indo-Pacific, what we call FOIP, will be the high priority for Japan. I will come to the second point later. On China, the rise of China will continue to be a challenge for the international community for decades to come, and especially so for Japan, as China is a huge neighboring country just across the East China Sea. And because the relationship with China is one of Japan's most important bilateral relationship that must be managed appropriately. Since the normalization of diplomatic relations between Japan and China in 1972, Japan has consistently contributed to the China's economic de development through such measures as the economic cooperation, or transfer of technology and know-how, and uh, has promoted exchanges of, of people in variety of fields, including culture, science, governmental administration, youth exchange, and has also encouraged its engagement, engagement in the international community. Japan, for its part, the Japanese companies in return, have benefited from doing business in the huge and expanding market in China. For example, there are currently 30, about 33,000 Japanese companies in China, compared to 9,000 in the US in 2020. In terms of tourism, a new engine for growth, Japan has set out a target of 40 million inbound visitors for the year 2020, for which Chinese tourists account for a very large portion of around 30%. The tar target for 2020, of course, could not be attained because of COVID-19. Japan-China relations have been developed to the point where they were denominated as mutually beneficial relationship based on common strategic interest, initiated in 2006 under the first Abe administration and crystallized in the joint statement when Chinese prime President Hu Jintao made a state visit to Japan in 2008. But the bilateral relations between the two countries were not without difficulties due to various reasons and incidents. Bilateral relations have deteriorated quickly thereafter, and one would say that uh, was at this one of the lowest points, just as Mr. Xi Jinping was acceding to leadership and Prime Minister Abe was returning to power for the second time as a Prime Minister towards the end of 2012. To the point that uh, for some period, holding of high-level meetings between the leaders or even meeting ministers were difficult. <laughs> Nevertheless, Japan and China have succeeded in gradually restoring and improving bilateral relations through so persistent effort of dialogue eventually taking advantage, advantage of opportunities of regular meetings, such as Japan, China, Korea, trilateral dialogue, ASEAN plus meetings, APEC, or G20. In 2018, Prime Minister Abe made the first purely bilateral visit to China in nine years. In June 2019, President Xi Jinping attended the G20 Osaka meeting realizing the first visit of a Chinese president in nine years. The state visit of President Xi Jinping was also in sight in spring 2020, last year. 
but was postponed for the reasons of COVID-19 pandemic. The intensified activities of China in the Japanese territorial and contiguous waters surrounding the Senkaku Islands, as well as the international criticism and awareness about its conduct in the international community is now raising question as to uh, such a visit taking place. Whether and when it will take place is yet to be considered. Japan and China share responsibilities to address the regional and international issue. At the same time, any unilateral attempt to change the status quo in East China Sea are entirely unacceptable. With the determination to defend Japan's territory, as well as uh, the territory, sea, and air place, Japan will continue to take a calm but resolute approach to the situation in close cooperation with our ally, the United States. At the same time, being indifferent to China's actions or decoupling it from the world economy cannot be a viable option. For Japan, Japan will continue to urge China to assume responsibility as a major power by communicating closely, closely with China. This must be done in cl close collaboration with the US and in coordination with other countries in the region who share the same values and objectives. In the strategic environment that I have just explained up to now, Japan is promoting a vision of free and open Indo-Pacific, what we call FOIP focusing on several pillars, such as promotion and consolidation of fundamental principles, such as rule of law and uh, uh, rule of law in the international community, pursuit of economic prosperity, including through ensuring connectivity and promoting FTAs and EPAs, and commitment to peace and stability, including maritime security. Since maintaining and strengthening the rule-based international order in the region cannot be achieved by Japan alone, we will not exclude any country and co cooperate widely with our partners who share the vision of FOIP to realize it. FOIP does not intend to create new organizations or compete with existing institutions, but is an inclusive vision where any country can express its support or its intention to be part of. The ASEAN leaders uh, adopted and established the ASEAN Outlook in, on Indo-Pacific in 2019, which shares many fundamental com uh, commonalities with FOIP. This vision is shared by countries like the US, Australia, India, and countries in Europe, such as UK, France, Germany, Netherlands, who are coming up with their vision on the Indo-Pacific. In the absence of a collective defense framework in East Asian region, the defense and security of the region has been ensured through a number of bilateral alliances with the United States, which constitute a so-called uh, hub and spoke structure. This is complemented by regional frameworks for cooperation dialogue, such as ASEAN Plus meetings, East Asia Summit, and ASEM, where EU is taking part. This combination of bilateral alliances, which provides deterrence, and multilateral framework, which provide press peer pressure through dialogue, is likely to be the basis for the peace and security in the region in the years to come. We are seeking to be de develop a more focused plurilateral framework, such as the Quad, Japan, US, Australia, India. Republic of Korea, economically highly developed and sharing common values, such as democracy, freedom, and the market economy, is an important neighboring country for Japan. A close cooperation between Japan, ROK, and Japan, US, our OK, is indispensable for the stability of the region, including in dealing with North Korea. However, the Japan-Korea relations are facing great difficulties due to issues, including the Korean court judgments 
related to the issue of former civilian worker from the Korean Peninsula or issue of conflict women. Even after Japan and the Republic of Korea normalized its relations in 1965, by concluding the Treaty of Basic Relations between the two countries and the agreement on the settlement of problems concerning property and claims and on economic cooperation, Japan Korea relations have had many difficulties and challenges, but the two governments have somehow managed these and built a close, friendly, cooperative relationship based on these treaties. However, those code judgments risk overthrowing the very foundation on which the post-war bilateral relationships are built. In order to restore trust and sound future-oriented relations, Japan is strongly urging the ROK to take appropriate measures. The development of North Korea's weapons of mass destruction missiles is a cause of instability in the region. At times, the ballistic missiles launched by North Korea have fallen into the Japanese exclusive economic zones or have flown over the Japanese archipelago to reach far into the Pacific Ocean. Can you imagine this happening in Western Europe? Japan will continue to coordinate closely with the United States and ROK and uh, co cooperate with other members of the international community, including China and Russia, to ensure full and effective implementation of UN Security Council resolutions and towards the nuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. For Japan, issue of the abduction of Japanese citizens by North Korea agents, which happened in the 1970s and 1980s, is also an acute, unsolved issue. The Japanese Prime Minister then, uh, Mr. Koizumi, and the DPRK leader, Kim Jong-il, met in two summit meetings in 2002 and 2004. Japan's position remains unchanged that it is fixed to normalize its relationship with North Korea in accordance with the Japan-North Korea Pyongyang Declaration of 2002 through comprehensively resolving the outstanding issues of concern such as abduction, nuclear missile issues, as well as settlement of the unfortunate past. Japan will aim to build appropriate relations with Russia as an important partner in the Asia Pacific region. Japan will engage in negotiations with Russia to resolve the territorial issue and conclude a peace treaty. For that purpose, Japan promotes the discussion on the joint economic activities on the four northern islands and the initiatives for a freer entry into the islands of former island residents. Japan calls also on Russia to play a constructive role on a variety of international affairs, such as North Korea, Syria, and Ukraine. Japan will continue to uh, work in cooperation with the G7 regarding measures against Russia over the situation in Ukraine. European countries are important partners for Japan who share fundamental values and principles such as freedom, democracy, rule of law, and human rights. Europe also plays a major role in formulating norms and standards in the international community and in up upholding major national, international frameworks such as the United Nations, the G7, the G20, and the WTO, and, and on subjects such as climate change and digitalization. Japan will work even more closely with Europe bilaterally and as an entity building on the basis of Japan, EU, EPA, SP, SPA, as well as, as, bi as a bilateral uh, framework. Uh, on the January 25th, Foreign Minister Motegi attended the EU Foreign Affairs Council for the first time as Foreign Minister of Japan, which was an opportunity for Japan to gain better understanding and support from the EU for the free and open in the Pacific. I hope our joint effort to maintain and strengthen the free and open rule-based international order will bear concrete outcomes. Let me come to the concluding remark. The international community is now confronting three major transformations and challenges. The first is how to overcome 
the difficult situation involving uh, challenges in, 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 uh, stemming, uh, in, in, overcome the crisis stemming from the global spread of COVID-19 and the difficult situations involving the challenges to human security. The second is the challenge against the universal values and international order that have so far underpinned the peace and prosperity of the international community uh, posed by such developments as uh, protectionism and unilateral attempts to change the status quo. The third is the emergence of common challenges facing the international community, including globalization, digitalization, and climate change, together with emerging challenges such as those in new domains, including outer space and cyberspace, as well as economic security. In the face of those epoch-making challenges, Japan will uphold its respect for multilateralism and take on a greater leadership role in establishing a free and fair order and rules on the basis of security and economic fronts, on both the security and economic fronts, uh, looking ahead to a post-COVID-19 world. This is clear orientation of Japan's foreign policy. As an example of such effort, Prime Minister Suga declared that Japan would realize carbon neutrality by 2050 uh, shortly after his taking office. This is based on the belief that the environmental measures are no longer constraints on economic growth. Instead, they are the key to transforming the industrial structure and producing, ro ro producing robust growth by dynamically changing our economy and society, promoting investments and enhancing productivity. In order to tackle these challenges in the post-COVID world, Japan wishes to cooperate with the US under new President Biden and with, with Europe and the EU, European Union, which are at the forefront in tackling these fields and with other like-minded countries. I said at the beginning, unimaginable events seems to happen every 10 years. However, social conflicts and confrontations caused by the increasing gaps between the rich and the poor, volatile security environment accelerated by rapid advancement of high technology, intensified natural disasters fueled by the effect of climate change, and pandemic outbreak in midst of explosion of the world population are the challenges that we are facing. Any of these cases indicates that the cycle of unprecedented events may become shorter in the future. So we must stretch our Im imagination, use our knowledge and experience to meet new challenges, avoid falling into simplistic thinking or easy conclusions, expect the unexpected. Thank you for your attention. So here we are, Excellency, Mr. Rector, Vice Rector, colleagues, students, friends, my name is Jan Wouters and uh, I have been asked to uh, moderate uh, this uh, Q&A part of this uh, ambassadorial lecture. And um, the system is very sophisticated because I'm getting all kinds of questions here on my tablet. And those questions are sometimes very long questions, so very like elaborated questions. I'm not sure I will take them all. I will try to actually uh, um, have a lively discussion. And I will, if you allow me also sometimes, just ask a question out of my own, uh, from my own interest. I've listened very carefully to the great uh, lecture by um, Mr. Ambassador. And if I may, I would like to kick off with a little question um, with regard to NATO, 
because you are indeed ambassador, uh, bilateral ambassador to our kingdom, Belgium, but also to NATO. And we know um, there are very interesting dynamics in the relationship between uh, uh, NATO and uh, Japan. Uh, there are also regularly security exercises at important places uh, and so on. You have in your lecture focused very strongly on, uh, well, the East Asian region, of course. Um, and I would like to ask you, how do you see the role of the NATO alliance with regard to Japan's uh, security um, issues and challenges? Please, Mr. Ambassador. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I think uh, you have uh, touched upon a very uh, uh, current uh, uh, lively issue because uh, NATO is pr presently uh, discussing about the reinforcement uh, of uh, its cooperation with uh, the Asia-Pacific partners, i.e. Japan, uh, South Korea, Australia, and New Zealand. And this is partly due to the fact uh, that uh, the recognition that the, uh, uh, the, the security in the North Atlantic area and the, 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 the shift of balance or the, the rise of uh, uh, China uh, cannot be uh, totally divided. And uh, so they are, uh, the, 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 the geopolitical uh, strategic situation in Asia Pacific is starting to affect uh, uh, the NATO countries, not necessarily militarily, but uh, still in terms of high tech or cyberspace or outer space or other areas. So this uh, recognition on the part of the uh, uh, NATO uh, alliance countries uh, have now is leading uh, for a, a strengthened cooperation with uh, uh, NATO and the Asia Pacific uh, countries, including Japan. Of course, we will not enter into a direct collective defense relationship, but I think there are areas in, in, uh, that I have mentioned that where the knowledge, exchange of knowledge uh, and experience can be of use for, for both, both sides. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. One of the uh, longer questions I received uh, has to do with the new world order where um, the person who asked the questions basically said, yes, if you want uh, to make a contribution to the world order, you have to have your independent foreign policy. And as we have heard throughout your lecture also, since Second World War, Japan has been very closely allied to the United States, and you have uh, emphasized that uh, again. So there's, there is, let's say, a strong dependency of Japan on the United States uh, in your uh, foreign policy. So the question asked is, how does Japan get more independent and how would it go away or lessen uh, this influence of the United States if it wants to? And what about the relations uh, with Europe and the rest of the world in this new world order? It's a very broad question, but of course the question is also, uh, what about the future relationship with the United States? Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, on this particular issue, maybe I have failed to emphasize the, uh, the uh, nature of the Japanese diplomacy. For example, in terms of engaging with China, uh, Japan has been consistently one of the countries in the international community that uh, have tried to engage China in a constructive manner uh, in the international community. Uh, for example, even after the Tiananmen incident, uh, Japan was one of the first countries to induce uh, uh, the, the, the China to come back to the international community, uh, re-establish bilateral uh, economic cooperation, which had been followed very quickly by other Western countries. And uh, so uh, uh, in this sense, uh, we had a di different way of approaching China. Uh, in comparison to some Western countries. But this was on a strong belief that uh, the engagement of China in the uh, international community is uh, important. And uh, as far as Southeast Asia is concerned, I have not had the time to, to expand my uh, explanation on this particular area. But uh, uh, in the end, towards the end of the 20th century, Japan has taken a very strong leadership in developing uh, regional uh, dialogue forums such as the ASEAN Plus Three or 
uh, Japan, South Korea, China trilateral dialogue. And this it was sort of in uh, response to the new world order where it was no longer uh, uh, a dichotomy between uh, under the Cold War structure. And so the uh, Asia Pacific region needed a new framework to discuss its own uh, security. And uh, so this was also another uh, uh, initiative that, that we have been taking uh, from the end of the 20th century and we have always been consistent. And this is why I have emphasized in my uh, presentation that uh, the, the two-wheel approach of having deterrence through uh, uh, um, alliance with the United States uh, matched with the multilateral, bilateral, uh, trilateral, or multilateral framework uh, uh, arousing public opinion or peer pressure is uh, the basis of uh, our security policy. In terms of cooperation with Europe, of course, uh, uh, I think there is very many uh, leeway uh, ways of expanding our cooperation. Uh, in this sense, the growing interest uh, on the part of the European countries to, uh, to, to come back to the Asia-Pacific region in terms of uh, uh, ensuring maritime security in the, in the area or engaging in uh, economic cooperation, the economic ties is a welcome uh, move. Whether or not we should depend on a, a multilateral collective defense arrangement with Europe and Japan uh, uh, is a, a, a much far-reaching question given the, the, the geographical uh, uh, distance. But maybe, uh, I mean, there are now security issues which uh, surpasses, uh, which goes beyond the geographical uh, uh, distance. So even if it's not uh, uh, collective defense, there may be areas where uh, some useful cooperation in technology or uh, may, can be done. Yeah, Our colleague, uh, Professor Van Overbeek, would like to uh, come in the discussion. Th thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ambassador, for this comment. And I was just wondering, uh, also a little bit in line what you have been explaining now, uh, what you think that the role of ASEAN uh, is in this uh, whole dynamics? Because you are emphasizing, of course, well, Europe is remote, that, that's very true. Uh, but on the same, uh, at the same time, you're emphasizing that it's important to have a multilateral uh, security uh, platform um, that uh, can reach out to, to the whole region. And there, um, well, if we look at, for example, the history of regional cooperation uh, in East Asia, then we see that, 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 that ASEAN is actually playing a very important role. Uh, and also in bridging, I would say, the EU um, with other parts uh, of the region. How do you see the future uh, of a kind of leadership role or collaboration between Japan and ASEAN uh, in the wake of the challenges that you have been explaining? I think there are uh, two aspects in uh, terms of cooperation with ASEAN. One is a sort of a, a, a public opinion formulating process or, or, or uh, a process of uh, arousing sensitivities on different issues, uh, most particularly in, in on what is happening uh, in the region, but uh, uh, maybe on a broader front uh, on other issues. And the second aspect is a, a practical cooperation in terms of capacity building for uh, maritime security or uh, capacity building uh, for disaster relief or, uh, or uh, the uh, uh, cooperation uh, in, in terms of uh, other areas, including very recently uh, uh, fight against uh, the virus uh, infections. Uh, and so uh, there are security and the broader security uh, issues that can be uh, subject of a, a practical cooperation. So I think those are the two aspects. Of course, the first aspect is sometimes very difficult because uh, I myself have been a negotiator for the, all, the, uh, the, all the ASEAN Plus meeting uh, joint communiques and chairman statements. And uh, when you want to talk about the behavior of uh, one country, uh, it is always, always very difficult. And uh, also the ASEAN countries would not want to be put in a place where they have to choose between A and B. 
and or, or whether they will have to choose size. And so this is the the, the, the delicate part of uh, how we uh, issue political messages. Uh, but this is uh, part of the uh, learning process. This is the part of the sensibilization process. And so I think it has uh, in itself a, a very important meaning. Thank you. Mr. Ambassador, you spoke about um, the security situation in East Asia, and you also mentioned that indeed um, there is little institutionalization in that respect, quite unlike the situation in Europe uh, with NATO and so on. Now, I would like to point to the existence of a particular organization, which is the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. And can I ask you what the Japanese attitude is towards this dynamic, which is, of course, with heavyweights like Russia and China? Uh, so how do you see that organization's role and its possible expansion in terms of membership? But also a little bit the what I would call the rapprochement between China and Russia in places like the United Nations Security Council, where, as you know, especially with regard to conflicts like Syria, there have been already a great number of situations in which the two countries have jointly exercised a veto right. So clearly something is happening also in that bilateral relation that affects the situation, I think, in East Asia, also from a security perspective. What would you like to comment on that? Well, on the Shanghai uh, yeah, uh, Forum, I think it, this is something that I, that I would, uh, I, I, definitely this is not a military alliance. I would say that this is maybe uh, a part, kind of a multilateral dialogue forum like the ASEAN plus meetings or the ARF uh, of a continental version. And uh, we have no opposition to, to that kind of endeavor. We do not have the intention of participating in it. Uh, uh, but uh, this is a dialogue of, in, under different groupings. Uh, it's not something that should be excluded, and uh, uh, we don't think that this is a sort of like a, uh, trying to make a group to wipe out the, the Western countries or democracy. Uh, I, I, I don't take that view. Um, on the issue of the uh, alliance of uh, uh, or what, what should I call cl closer relationship, partnership between Russia and China. Uh, this is very difficult to say, but uh, the, the basic question is that uh, does the two uh, countries share uh, uh, the uh, uh, strategic long-term objective, or is it a sort of an alliance for uh, a, a problem that lies just in front of uh, uh, their uh, uh, eyes. And uh, so this is something that uh, we must uh, uh, say. And uh, as I ha emphasized, as I f touched upon in my uh, presentation, the, 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 uh, the presence of China is overwhelmingly not big in the Asia area compared to, to, to Russia in terms of economy or population. And the economic influence of China into the Siberian area or increasing, and that is also happening in Central Europe. And uh, so what is the, the common strategic objective that those two countries would share in, in those parts of the world? So, so I, I think we, 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 we have to be, we sort of analyze very carefully the implications of the relationship. But at the same time, we don't want to push uh, or force them into coming almost like a, a military bloc, or, or I, don't, I don't think that will be in the interest of the, the entire uh, in international order. An another question would maybe be also um, how Japan, and you have been mentioning the, this, this concept of human security, where I think that Japan has in the past also uh, been developing a very own uh, content of uh, how um, uh, stability and even security related matters have been approached. Um, in, in that sense, I'm wondering how you see the current crises, uh, not only related to, to military aspects or to, to defense related aspects, but a kind of, how would I say, new approach towards societies, towards human 
human uh, security, uh, also related to sustainability, to the gap, as you have been mentioning, between poor and rich. Uh, and in that sense, do you see that Japan can develop maybe in what is often called soft power approaches? Japan can develop uh, a kind of alternative or new own uh, identity there uh, in, uh, in this field? Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, the, the basic policy the, that Japan has been pursuing is that in order to prevent the international conflicts, uh, uh, you have to go to the root cause, which is the, uh, the, uh, the uh, human security or, uh, or what may be called call, call eradicating the poverty or uh, uh, so, and uh, ensuring uh, uh, economic development, starting from a humanitarian need, but also uh, making uh, future economic uh, development possible through uh, development of economic infrastructure inf and, uh, and so forth. And so um, uh, when we are uh, conducting uh, uh, international uh, discussions on uh, the, uh, how we cope with the uh, uh, the, the current uh, pandemic, uh, we always emphasize also the importance of going to the basics of uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, helping the, uh, the, the basic national health system uh, 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 by emphasizing the important importance of uh, uh, universal health coverage uh, in all countries. We, pride, we have pride in our universal health coverage system in Japan, and we think that if this can be uh, propagated into the developing countries, get, this can also be useful in uh, fighting an uh, outbreak of pandemics or even preventing it, uh, uh, and in the case of an outbreak, to, 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 to treat it. And of course, our resources are limited, and uh, uh, there are some uh, big contributors uh, uh, in the garden, but, uh, but I think uh, the, going to the basics of uh, uh, the, the human security is a very important aspect of uh, uh, preventing international conflict. Thank you. I have a number of related questions with regard to economic governance, uh, Mr. Ambassador. Maybe first of all regarding multilateral economic governance. Uh, as you have rightly said, Japan is very much engaged in multilateralism. You are a member of the G20, of the G7, You're very strongly engaged in the United Nations. You are also a member of the OECD, and so on and so forth. You are a member, of course, and an active member of the WTO. And if I may just maybe highlight a little bit the latter, the WTO, the World Trade Organization, is, as we know, in a, in a deep crisis. A couple of things that do not seem to work anymore. The negotiation process is in difficulties. The Doha round is more or less declared either dead or in a comatic stage. The appellate body has been disabled by the refusal of the United States to agree on the appointment or reappointment of judges. So it is very clear that the WTO also, which now has a new director general, uh, is in urgent need of uh, reform. And I would like to ask you how uh, Japan looks at um, this reform process, the opportunities that may arise now with the Biden administration, but also uh, knowing that there have already been joint initiatives between the EU and Japan on WTO reform, how you see that WTO reform. I have a second question on bilateral relations, but I would maybe first ask you to, to reply to this question on multilateral mm -hmm. economic mm -hmm. governance. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I th we uh, place utmost importance on the, the, the reform of the WTO because we have a strong belief in the multilateralism. We have been a very strong uh, believer of the, 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 the round negotiation to begin with for the liberalization of uh, goods. I have been personally involved uh, as negotiator in the Uruguay round negotiation and the Doha development around uh, the negotiations. And uh, so uh, we have a very strong uh, uh, belief and confidence uh, in what have the WTO have achieved. And it is true that in the recent years, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, dispute settlement system has not functioned. And uh, we have been partly uh, uh, 
a victim of uh, that uh, uh, in a particular case uh, because it was not uh, fully uh, functioning. And, uh, but that, that is not the only reason, but I think we need uh, a multilateral framework which can be uh, functioning as a third party judge or who can make a third party judgment. Uh, all the more so that uh, now we have uh, not only a strong entity uh, like United States, but uh, EU in itself is becoming uh, a, a very strong economic power. And uh, I hope uh, that the EU will not adopt the policy of EU first. Uh, and so, in the, uh, anyways, uh, in, uh, if you look at those situation, uh, we have we see a growing number of strong economic powers. Uh, we need uh, a multilateral, fair uh, 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 dispute settlement system, and, and so that is why we think it's very important to work for that. And we are very much looking forward to working with uh, the European Union on this particular issue. Thank you very much. Your answers are so rich that it immediately triggers other questions because if you express a little bit of concern about the EU first, I'm not sure if you are also referring to last week's joint communication that the High Representative and the European Commission adopted on multilateralism in which the EU expresses its engagement, of course, towards multilateralism, but also much more strongly positions the idea of geopolitical uh, use of its, yeah. of its powers. Uh, speaking of multilateralism, you also highlighted in your um, um, excellent uh, speech that uh, Japan really engages in the existing uh, multilateral institutions and does not engage in, let's say, uh, parallel institutions or creating new institutions. I mean, what we have seen China doing, for instance, in the whole area of, let's say, development, is the creation of a parallel institution, the Asian Infra Infrastructure and Investment Bank, which, interestingly enough, 18 European Union countries have joined, but, for instance, not Japan and the United States. What is Japan's attitude towards the, I, uh, the AIIB? Well, um, uh, yes, uh, uh, actually, I was... Uh, uh, in, in, the, in the government, uh, more or less in charge of that discussion. And uh, it was uh, mostly about the, 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 uh, the worries about the governance uh, that uh, uh, such bank can be, can guarantee, uh, because we know that uh, the, who is the owner or who, uh, pretend, who, who, who is taking the initiative of uh, having such a bank, and uh, uh, and we did think that uh, we have already have the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank, and that uh, why should we have a, 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 another a, a, another institution with a, a very close function, uh, uh, which will be more or less under a, a strong. Uh, influence of a, a certain country. So, frankly speaking, uh, I remember I, I was very disappointed when we learned that uh, the European countries, uh, the major European countries, uh, announced uh, uh, one after another uh, its intention to participate. But I, I do think that uh, at the end of the day, the presence of the European countries was important to, 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 to guarantee the the the. the the, the governance that it now has. But uh, at the same time, I, I, this is my understanding that it has not become as influential or has, or has it been uh, expected. Uh, it is not, uh, I, I may be wrong because I'm not uh, on the newest note, but uh, yes. But uh, yes, you, you are right. But uh, you must also take into account the, the fact that the, that country is not only making parallel institutions, but trying to influence power in the existing institutions, because they have uh, four heads in the international specialized agencies, uh, as compared to one uh, for all the major Western countries. And, uh, and uh, of course, I will not name the organization. There are other organizations with the chief 
who is under a very strong influence, uh, who have benefited from the economic cooperation from that country. Thank you very much. Yes, indeed, the, the rise and rise within the United Nations specialized agencies of that particular country is indeed very remarkable. We have to go to some other questions that the participants ask us, and a totally different subject, but the problem of the rapidly aging population mm. in Japan. We had a question uh, asking that, well, how does Japan see and face that problem, having in mind its national debt and work culture? Well, I think uh, uh, I, I have not mentioned that particular issue, but uh, it is an acute problem. I think uh, it is the most fundamental problem that uh, probably the Japan is facing. And uh, the, the, the solution that we can produce is, uh, is make people work longer and uh, put in more people into the work labor market. And uh, so uh, that's number one. Number two is having more uh, foreign workers coming uh, into the Japanese uh, labor market. That is why I refer to the uh, new uh, status of residence that uh, the, uh, the former uh, cabinet have created. We had a plan of having a temporary worker coming of a magnitude of some hundreds of thousands uh, coming into the, not the high level uh, areas, but a very sim simple labor and uh, service people. And uh, so we were, in a sense, uh, starting to change the gear in terms of uh, who can work uh, in the Japanese market. And third, of course, would be try to induce uh, wealth from the foreign countries. And the typical case was the tourism. And uh, tourism is uh, not uh, 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 arrival of working people, but uh, they come and they spend uh, and they, they go back. And so this is one type of uh, inducing uh, wealth from the outer market. And this is some of the, the solutions that we have tried to, to put in to, 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 to maintain our economic growth. And, uh, and of course, uh, we would have also have to go through the, uh, the rates of productivity uh, per labor. And I think uh, we are hoping for this reason that the, 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 if the pandemic has some positive effect, that the digitalization and the change of working methods and all those things may be able to, to give a, a, a sort of a new effort to the, to the rate of productivity. Thank you very much. In fact, I have the privilege of sitting next to a colleague who will become soon a foreign worker in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, going to the University of Tokyo, a very prestigious um, university. So congratulations for that, Dimitri. I have a question, if I may, about uh, women's rights. Sorry? Um, women's rights. Um, the person asking the question um, says, look, countries that promote women's rights domestically and through international development have benef benefited from improved perceptions uh, abroad. However, Japan seems to rank on the 121st place out of 153 countries in the World Economic Forum's Global Gender Gap Index. So the question is, how can Japan improve this position of, uh, let's say, the position of women's rights? You have touched upon it uh, in, your, in your lecture, but maybe you can comment a little bit on this. Yes. Um, oh. Yes, I, I, th I think, as I said uh, in my uh, previous uh, answer, uh, now the society needs the, the, the women working in the uh, labor market. Uh, and uh, because uh, we have a declining population and we, we, do not, we no longer have the, uh, the comfort of having women and not working outside uh, their homes. And uh, so, and of course, there is also another uh, uh, hope that, that uh, the sentiment uh, of the, the Japanese younger generation will change, that, uh, that uh, it will become a matter of course that uh, the, the, both the couples will be working uh, 
outside home, and which was not my case uh, in my generation, but uh, I think uh, this will be changing. And it, it is becoming the case that, uh, uh, and that is why, uh, that is why the, the administration is putting an extra effort on uh, having uh, uh, the kindergartens and uh, homes to keep the, the very infants uh, while the two uh, couple work outside. And uh, so this is one of the top priority policies that the Japanese government is pursuing so that people can work outside of their homes. Mr. Ambassador, we're extremely grateful for this very open um, dialogue that we can have with you today at KU Leuven, but alas, the time is running fast and we are approaching a moment that we have to um, close down uh, our, our conversations. I still have quite a number of questions that the audience would have liked to, to raise with you, but I'm also convinced there will be future opportunities to do that, and I really would like to congratulate you for doing that so well and in such an open manner. So may I uh, thank you once more um, for um, your uh, excellent um, um, speech and for the openness in answering the various uh, questions that were raised. And, and tell you how much honored our university was to receive you today at our uh, beautiful Central uh, University Hall here. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, it's been a pleasure of having you all in our um, ambassadorial lecture today. Of course, we count on you coming back and visit us back for the next upcoming ambassadorial lectures, which are going to uh, indeed be scheduled uh, very, very soon. I guess in the first stage still on a virtual basis, but we also hope that once upon a time, this beautiful promotion hall will again be filled and packed with people and students and not just cameras. Thank you very much and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.